In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe Help us see 
Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. Let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing And in our weakness and temptation
And sometimes you know things are going to be better a certain way than we think. And God, whatever it is, we lay it at your hands, we keep it at your feet, and we continue. We continue to run the race with perseverance. We grieve not as those who disbelieve, but we grieve as those who hope. And we hope in this future where heaven comes, this new heaven and this new earth will be there someday. And that you would give us strength and courage to attempt to bring it here now. And God, it is through your son Jesus that all of this is possible. His once forever sacrifice for our sin was an atonement, a perfect and permanent atonement for our sin and our sinful nature that we would get to spend eternity with you. And in doing so, as we come before you, as we speak to you, as we are active in relationship with you, you are igniting us, you are restoring us, renewing us, and giving us strength. This Jesus taught us how to love each other, how to care for each other, how important it is that we communicate with you, God, and how imperative this relationship is. May we continue his work. May we follow his lead. And may we never forget how he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I think we have some special music from our choir. Maybe.
I did. I thought you were jumping right into that next song. I did. Wait till they get adjusted here, and we will get ready for the Apostles' Creed. How about that? If you are able to stand and would like to stand, you can join me in the Apostles' Creed. If you would like to stay seated, you can do well. It's okay. <laughs> hey, there we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you would like to remain standing for the reading of Scripture, you may, or if you need to sit down, you can do that as well. We're going to continue on in the book of Hebrews, and today we are going to be in Hebrews chapter 5, and I'm going to share with you verses 1 through 10. As soon as I take my glasses off, and can read it. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as theirs. And no one can become a high priest simply because he wants such an honor. He must be called by God for this work, just as Aaron was. That is why Christ did not honor himself by assuming that he could become high priest. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And in another passage, God said to him, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who believe him. And God des designated him to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So how was your week? Good? Busy? <laughs> Crazy? Up? Down? Sideways? Sick? Not sick? Good? Not good? I'm assuming that it's a combination of all those things, right? Like everybody else. We look around, we see everybody, and we're like, oh yeah, I know what they went through this week. <laughs> it's pretty much kind of what I went through. It might have looked different, it might have been different, but we all have ups and downs. Whatever it was, I hope that, you know, we're in October, so I hope we haven't completely forgotten what we started thinking about at the beginning of the year, and that was the importance of, Again, we bring it back up here again today in Hebrews. The importance of that communication and relationship with God. When we engage in that on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, it's what brings us into his presence. It's how he speaks to us. We speak to him. It's how our relationship works. And when he does, he pushes us into uh, or, or see a repentance that's needed. 
whether it's from things in our life or people in our life or relationships or whatever it is, there's things that we are doing or are engaging in that are keeping us from experiencing God to the full. And when we repent of those things, he is the one that then gives us that refreshment and that renewal. Like having the tools in our toolbox. Remember that series? Like learning from Jesus' teachings and like understanding why and how Jesus is our high priest. I think it's um, ironic, but yet good, that we see in these scriptures things that we've been repeating and hearing over and over again, right? Jesus, once forever, becomes our high priest. We say that all the time, right? That's, that's acknowledged, We've been engaging in what these characteristics are that make him the high priest. We learned about him being the perfect leader uh, a couple weeks ago, right? The perfection that's involved in who he was. He was not sinful. Therefore, he does not have to atone for his own sin. Today's text, we learn that there is uh, the earthly priest. Well, they have to atone for their own sin at that point, right? They have, to, they have to atone for their own sins as well as others. They would die. We learned about that, right? So they weren't perfect. They would come and go. Jesus is not. We also learned last week about how he's understanding. He's been through what we've been through, right? Think of the things that we can learn from Jesus about what he went through, and that is how God sees you and understands you in the same way. And now today we see that Jesus, the high priest, is praying. Communication is important. And it should be important to us too, right? Today we can even break this down into two sections again, right? There's the section that talks about the old ways. And then there's the section that talks about Jesus, the high priest ways, what it's like now. And so we see these these inverse pieces here, uh, noting that, that the original priests in the church were planted there and, and were originally Levites. So they would normally come from a, a certain tribe or race of people, if you will, the tribe of the Levites. They were just called to this ministry at that time. Uh, one of the reasons that he brings up Mel, Melchizedek in here very often, twice in this text perhaps today, is because Melchizedek was not a Levite priest. He was a priest that was outside of the Levite order hierarchy who was called to be a priest, even though the, some people didn't want to believe it, some people didn't want to follow it, yet he was. And so the relationship between him and the king at the time was, was very tense, very uh, unsure, unsteady, because he wasn't a Levite. But Jesus is now coming from the same order. And the reason being is, is that Jesus is not the same as the earthly high priests. He was different. He was perfect. He did not have to atone for his own sin. Not only did he not have to atone for his own sin, but he died as the sacrifice for sin, but then is still alive. Talk about not being normal priests, right? <laughs> He offers up the sacrifice and understands us, but in doing so, calls each of us into priesthood. Oh, wait a minute, right? <laughs> wait, what? I mean, I, I, I'm a priest too? Yeah, you are. Each one of us is a priest. Whether we feel like we, we should fit the role of priest or not— is irrelevant because priest in this sense of meaning doesn't mean that you're standing on a stage or that you're providing sacrifices for someone else's sin. What priest means in this sense is that you are able to be engaged in a relationship with God and you are going to be offering spiritual blessings daily, hourly, minute by minute to this God who loves you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Peter himself says, You are coming to Christ, who is the living, again living, cornerstone of God's temple. Not dead, alive. 
The temple is alive, right? He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. He was chosen by God for the great honor of being your high priest once forever. And you, meaning all of us, are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Not only are you called to be a priest, but you're called to be a living temple. That's why we look at each other and we're together and we're stronger together because, yeah, what, what is a building of one brick, right? Doesn't look very cool, does it? <laughs> We've been talking about our 10th anniversary of this new building, but what if this building only existed because two or three bricks were here? It's about everybody coming together to be the temple of God themselves. What's more, he says, you are his holy priests. <clears throat> Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Do you? <laughs> we, we are called to the priesthood of being believers and followers of Jesus. That's what he's calling us to. And however, he is still alive, so he is still our high priest. And because of Jesus, we no longer have to bring sacrifices all the time for the atonement of sin because that's already been accomplished. Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is finished. And what he meant by that was, you no longer have to bring constant atonement for sin. I've done that. How did he prove that? He rose from the grave. He ascends to heaven, and he's now seated alive at the right hand of God. Our priest is not dead. He's very much alive. And our spirit and our souls have the opportunity to commune with God that he may influence us and that we might limit our own desires and earthly wants. Just as Jesus was chosen, each of you are chosen. <clears throat> if we move on to verses 7 through 10, we start to see more of the characteristics of who Jesus was. Jesus was a communicator with God. That was his key to his strength. From the moment he was baptized by his cousin John, uh, the Holy Spirit descends upon him. God speaks and says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus begins this ministry. How? By going and fasting for 40 days. What is he doing for 40 days? He's trying to strengthen his relationship with his Father in heaven as much as he can. And in doing so, the devil comes and attacks him at his weakest points. This is also for us. Because we are weak. But he is strong. He withstood the temptations. He remained perfect so that when it was time for him to sacrifice his life, he was still perfect. He was still unblemished. He was still the Son of God. Now imagine if Jesus had gone off into the wilderness to face the devil and temptation with your prayer life. I didn't mean to hit a button there, but yikes, right? He had a complete connection with God, and it was strong, but he also understood the importance of communication and the relationship that was there. If you remember right, he was very much flesh and yet very much God. If he was going to have the strength to heal and provide spiritual guidance for people on a constant basis here on earth, it was going to have to come from a source of strength. It wasn't going to be able to come just from his own free will, right? He had to have the guidance. He had to have the strength. It's often uh, you see Jesus disappears, right? He runs from the crowd. He was alone. Nobody knew where he was. He fell asleep. He took a nap on the boat in the middle of a storm. No. Jesus is resting and he's connecting and communicating with God because he was not good enough in his fleshly body 
to do it on his own. He knew that. He knew the importance of that. That's why he was guiding us to do the same thing. If left up to his earthly flesh, he would have failed. He sat in the Garden of Eden and even asked for it, didn't he? God, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. In other words, saying, God, I don't want to die right now. And yet because of that strong relationship, because of that closeness, because he understood that God knew more than he did, he says, not my will, but yours be done. And God provided him the strength to withstand the beating, to withstand the pain, to withstand the betrayal, the heartache, the broken, everything that we experience as people. He withstood it all for the victory that we would get to have. He goes on in verses 8 and 9 today and says, Even though Jesus was God's son, <clears throat> he learned obedience from the things he suffered. That means there's, there's things to learn when we suffer. There's things to learn when we hurt. <clears throat> he learned obedience from the sing things he suffered. And in this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. Here we see that word perfect again, like we did a couple weeks ago, and much used like it was a couple weeks ago. Jesus was perfect, and if he was fully God and fully man, well then why in the world would he have to be off praying so much? That's the source of strength. It's the source of everything that we do. It's the source of our lives. We often feel like prayer is just, it's us asking God for stuff, right? How many times do your prayers just sound like a genie, right? I wish, I want, I really need, right? We, we want healing, from what's hurting. We want uh, uh, funds to cover the bills that we don't know how to pay. We want the person that we love who's battling cancer. We don't want them to have to go through that anymore. Insert problem here, and that's what we keep doing, and we keep going to God and asking for it. What we have to realize is that it's not about the asking, but it's about God communicating with us and providing for us what we need, whether it's what we've desired and asked him for or not. I used the illustration earlier this morning about my brother. I have not, in the course of uh, 40 years now, I have not yet gotten the answer to that prayer. And I've asked. I've asked nicely, and I've asked very angrily. I've asked, why did you take my brother from me? And I've also asked, God, Help me understand why my brother had to die. And the answer comes back, and it's always the same. It doesn't matter. And I'm always confused and conflicted with God, and I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't matter? It obviously matters. I've had this relationship with him. He was my hero. And he says, okay, hang in there because I'm not done yet. The story's not completed. This mission is not over, and heaven is coming to earth, and he is coming with me. It might hurt now, but there's going to be a time when all of these hurts are healed, and everything is together, and the more we communicate with God, the more he opens up his heart to us, and the more we open up our hearts to him, and it becomes this beautiful relationship. Thankfully for us, Jesus didn't get what he asked for in prayer. He got the will of God. And in the process of asking, he found the strength with God's help to withstand what we deserved as punishment so that he could defeat sin and death on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus. Today, Jesus is teaching us that prayer in itself is not the most important thing about our relationship with God. 
Our relationship with God is important, but it's important for us to be active, participating members of that relationship. It's not about just opening up a prayer book and reading this prayer. It's helpful. That's encouraging. But what it is, is it's an active, participating member of a relationship. Because we cannot see him, because we cannot visually touch or see him or physically touch him, it's harder, but it's still a part of the relationship. Prayer is simply a vehicle by which we can continue that relationship. We can hear him speak. We can speak to him. He can listen to us, and we can listen to him. I did a, a quick search online, and I found this, this, this uh, site, uh, Chrysalis Courses, and it was about communication and relationship. And I found this quote in there. <clears throat> now, I don't think this is directly related to a human-to-God relationship, but I want you to think about your prayer life, and I want you to think about if whether or not you have good communication with God. Communication is important in any relationship. It allows you to effectively share feelings, opinions, and expectations. Many people fail to communicate due to a fear of rejection or the fear that they'll end up upsetting or even losing their partner, family members, or friends. Hmm. When we think about why we don't pray, or we think about why we don't continue to keep God in our communication, maybe it's because we're afraid. We're, uh, we're afraid of rejection, right? God knows me, so he's not going to be really proud of me. Maybe he won't answer my prayer because of what I've done or not done. None of that's true. Maybe we're not communicating with him because we're afraid he's going to take people away from us. He's going to alienate us. He's going to make us something that we don't want to be. And that might be true. Jesus understood, though, the importance of communication with God, that you can share your feelings and not have a fear of rejection. I mean, Jesus was God in human form. He literally asked him not to do the thing that he knew he was here to do. If that's not sharing your feelings, I don't know what is. And yet God said, no, it's okay. And he assured Jesus he had to give him that hope and be like, we win, son. Not only are you going to win, but I'm going to give you the strength to win, and then you're going to empower thousands upon thousands upon millions of people to win. He's not going to get upset with you. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to reject you, all because we have a high priest in Jesus who understands us, who is perfect, and who is very much still alive. So how can we improve our communication with God so that we can improve our relationship with him? Maybe you need to yell, right? Maybe you need to get some things off your chest and you're afraid, and it's okay. Yeah, I'm sure he's heard worse. And I said it last week and I'll say it again now. If you're afraid of, to be rejected, if you're afraid of that life of prayer might engage in you something else that's there, go for it. Because God is never going to love you more today or less today because of what you've done or chosen to do. He loves you the same today, tomorrow, and for eternity. I hope and I pray that not only will your communication with God improve and that relationship improve, but that it improves all of your other relationships that you have as well. I hope that you'll find strength to begin a solid prayer life, one that doesn't just start and stop from, you know, six to seven or five to six or whatever your prayer time is, but one that continues on. You include them in your life. You include them in decisions. You include them in who you are and what you think should come next. I hope that through an improvement in that prayer life and belief in this high priest that you can change the world and you can do so much more when you're strengthened in your relationship with God. Amen.
Join me as we pray over our offering. Again, we still have our box back there. You're welcome to give offering. If you're online, uh, check out our website because we still have offering via PayPal online as well. We do not come before you, God, as people who are putting money in an offering plate because we want to get to heaven. We are acknowledging here in this moment that you, God, have provided us with everything. From the moment we are born to the moment we die, everything in between is gift. You've given us talents, energy, time, money, and we want to give back to you in response to your word what is already yours. Whatever we can give back to you, we do so with joy, knowing that you will multiply it, make it grow, consecrate it, and allow people to know how much you love them through us. God, we are grateful and thankful that you chose Jesus to give us eternal life. In doing so, we return our praise. It is in Jesus' name that we pray, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to close uh, with a hymn. So if you're able to stand and join us, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And so a little bit more from my research on communication and relationships. And think about your relationship with God and how it looks. Here are just some reasons that highlight the importance of communication in relationships. One, get to know each other. From understanding their likes and dislikes through gaining an insight into their morals and values... Open and frequent communication is essential if you want to really get to know someone and allow them to know the real you. Avoid misunderstanding. Number two, avoid any misunderstandings which can lead to a breakdown of communication or the relationship as a whole. And number three, set clear expectations. In any relationship, it's important to set these expectations. Once the expectations are set, you should be able to enjoy a healthy, positive, and satisfying relationship. Sounds like Jesus might have known the importance of good communication with God. Friends, I hope you have a great week. 
I hope God meets you where you are and encourages you and blesses you. Amen.